Thank you and good afternoon. I'm uh, delighted to be with you for this weekend at Bishops and very grateful to Jessica Riddell for her invitation to speak here today and very cognizant of the fact that her first name, Jessica, was one of the many inventions of William Shakespeare. He invented the name Jessica for the character of Shylock's daughter in The Merchant of Venice. Just one of his seminal contributions in my view. Now, I'm a psychiatrist and that gives me a certain license to speak about madness. But how do I get off on speaking about Shakespeare? Well, there are uh, several reasons. First of all, I happen to have the gene for self-confidence completely unrelated to ability. <laughs> and this gene is usually found on the male chromosome. <laughs> Second of all, as you've heard, I'm the chair of the Stratford Festival, North America's largest and leading classical repertory theater specializing in Shakespeare, where this season, the theme of our season, is madness, minds pushed to the edge. The third reason is that theater, much like medicine, runs in my family blood. This is a picture of uh, my late grandfather, or I should say our late grandfather, as my cousins are sitting in the audience, Alton Goldblum. Alton Goldblum was best known as the professor and chair of pediatrics at McGill University and pediatrician in chief of the Montreal Children's Hospital in the 1940s and early 1950s. But this was a very different Alton Goldblum, a picture taken about 100 years ago when he was a professional actor and very well versed in the works of William Shakespeare. This is a staged headshot, obviously, rather than a casual photograph. But his deep knowledge and his love of Shakespeare infused his teaching and even his writings as reflected in this, oh, I just did something horrible there. This 1936 paper published in the American Journal of the Diseases of Children called Shakespeare and Pediatrics, in which he chronicled the various childhood ailments that appeared throughout the works of Shakespeare. He made an appearance on this campus as well. In 1962, he's at the top right of your screen when he was honored by Bishop's University with an honorary degree. Over the course of his life, he befriended many people, and one of them was Tyrone Guthrie, as Tyrone Guthrie was preparing to inaugurate the first season of the Stratford Festival as its founding director. More importantly, he infected his sons, Victor, who's here today, and my father, Richard, with a profound love of theater. And that contagion spread to the third and fourth generations of our family. And I was likewise infected. I was a child actor, a teenage actor, a young adult actor. And I'm going to show you now a rare archival photograph, <laughs> never seen before, of my very final stage appearance in 1975 when I was in my final year of my undergraduate education. The rather angry looking person with tails and khakis, not a usual sartorial combination, is a much younger me. And this was in an original musical comedy called Mad About Mints. For reasons that are completely inexplicable to me, this musical has never been staged since its debut. <laughs> We opened and closed in Cambridge. <laughs> and I happened to play Seymour Mintz, a failed poet whose life was based on Milton's verse that I never understood before, during, or after the run of this play. Uh, it was the enthusiastic consensus of theater critics in Boston and Cambridge that I should immediately apply to medical school. But uh, 40 years later, I find myself once again dealing with the subject of the stage from the perspective of a psychiatrist. Now, why would madness be a theme for exploration in theater? 
Well, in contrast to the terrible impact that mental illness has on the lives of individuals and their families, the stage and its artifice allows us to safely explore and to think about and to observe madness in relative safety. Indeed, love, aggression, lust, greed, jealousy, death, disintegration. We get to watch all of these played out with the shared knowledge of make-believe. We can be moved, we can be inspired, we can be frightened, all the while we're comforted by the safety of the pretense. So then why focus on Shakespeare in particular? Well, because he had a profound influence on how we perceive the inner life of people. And he used the theater not simply to tell us the when, where, and how of human drama, but also to illustrate the why. Because 400 years after his death, his plays endure, not simply in English, but all over the world. The lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. A famous line by Duke Theseus in A Midsummer Night's Dream, which incidentally you can see in two different versions this season at the Stratford Festival. <laughs> uh, one traditional and one highly experimental. This, uh, this frequently quoted line from the dream draws a comparison that actually became an article of faith in the Romantic era, and it's one that dogs us still. The idea that artistic creation, including the writing and performing of plays, springs from some form of madness that fuels inspiration. And even in our postmodern era, this remains a romantic association. It's one that's neither supported by evidence nor particularly helpful to people as they struggle with mental illness. Admittedly, our concepts of madness have changed over time, despite the timeless relevance of Shakespeare's plays. As we confront the coming tsunami of aging, of dementia, King Lear remains a profoundly apt play for our time. Not that living too long was a big problem in Shakespeare's day. In his time, the model of mental illness was either demonic possession or some kind of imbalance of the four humors of the body. And by the way, the four humors, that's not four separate jokes. The four <laughs> humors referred to those essential bodily fluids. Black bile, the word from which melancholia derives. Yellow bile, we had two types of bile and then blood, and finally, phlegm. And it was an imbalance of those four that got people into trouble. Although I can tell you, as a public speaker, just a phlegm imbalance will get you into trouble. <laughs> the very first book published in English about mental illness was called A Treatise on Melancholy. And it was published in 1586, three years before Shakespeare wrote his first play. We have no idea whether Shakespeare actually read this book in English, but the beauty of Shakespeare's very skimpy biography is that people can assume anything they want about William Shakespeare's life. And indeed, biographies of him usually say, he might well have, or it's possible that he, because nobody knows. It, it creates a wonderful blank canvas for all of us to impose our beliefs about what influenced Shakespeare. Now, I should say that uh, the word suicide is a word not coined by Shakespeare, but one that came into existence after Shakespeare's death. Nevertheless, if you go through the works of Shakespeare, you will find, and the various estimate, between 12 and 15 suicides that occur in the stories of his plays. Antony and Cleopatra, which we are doing this season at Stratford, uh, <laughs> contains, in fact, at least four suicides that are mentioned in the plays. And in the less well-known play, King John, which you could also see this season at Stratford, Constance says the following, 
She says, for being not mad, but sensible of grief, my reasonable part produces reason how I may be delivered of these woes and teaches me to kill or hang myself. Now, we're only lately in Canada having a public discussion about mental illness and about suicide in particular. Suicide, as you heard, the second leading cause of death for young people aged 15 to 24. But 400 years ago, Shakespeare was writing about it and his actors were talking about it. Let me flash forward to the 19th century because by the 19th century, leading American psychiatrists revered the words of Shakespeare with a literalist fundamentalism that would only be replaced a century later by a similar religious devotion to every single word of Sigmund Freud. The man you see here is somebody you probably won't recognize, but he has a great Yankee name. His name was Amariah Brigham, and he was one of the leading psychiatrists in the United States in the early 1800s. He was the superintendent of the New York State Lunatic Asylum in Utica, New York, which was the first publicly funded asylum for the mentally ill in the United States. He was also the founder of the leading scientific journal in psychiatry in the United States, which was then known as the American Journal of Insanity. They, they changed the name later. In that very first issue in 1844 of his journal, in the very first article, who was the focus? William Shakespeare. And here's what Brigham wrote of Shakespeare. The more we read of Shakespeare, the more we are astonished not so much at his wonderful imagination, but at the correctness and immensity of his knowledge. And on no one subject, in our opinion, has he shown more of his remarkable ability and accuracy than on insanity. There is not one mental disorder he has not alluded to and pointed out the causes and the method of treatment. Now, remember, this is written uh, more than 200 years after Shakespeare's death. So it's an indirect reflection on the lack of progress that was made, as well as a hyperbolic perspective on what Shakespeare had actually described. But he noted uh, that in Shakespeare's many descriptions of people with mental illness throughout his plays, he wrote as follows. The insane that he described are not imaginary characters, but now may be found in every large asylum. In the 19th century, it was a time when treatments were rare throughout all of medicine. There were very few effective treatments for most illnesses. It was a matter of time, of observation, of comfort, and general nonspecific care. But it was also a time of astute clinical observation because there was not a lot else that clinicians could do. So they were actually much more mindful of the details of people's experience of illness than they are today. So it makes sense that they would be drawn to a writer of greatness who was able to observe, to synthesize, and express with eloquence those characteristics of illness that they saw every day in their work. In the 20th century, Madness became reinterpreted through the prism of Freud and his followers. Suddenly we were hearing about the Oedipal conflict of Hamlet, the pathological jealousy of Othello or Leontes. All of these became grist for the mill of psychoanalysis. And this was a natural fusion because if Freud was a pioneer in describing the unconscious and its workings, so did Shakespeare take us from the theatrical narrative of events and actions to the internal mental journey of his characters. But this new connection between Freud and the works of Shakespeare moved the Shakespeare and madness connection beyond the clinical signs and symptoms of illness into an exploration of underlying motivation. Now, according to one scholar, Freud himself began reading Shakespeare at age eight. That's no longer, I think, in the public school curriculum, but uh, he knew Shakespeare's works backward, and he quoted them at great length. Unfortunately, 
Freud also became a very strong-minded Oxfordian. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that he believed that Shakespeare didn't actually write the works of Shakespeare, that they were instead written by the Earl of Oxford. And so, as has often been said about Sigmund Freud, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Here's the face of Colm Fiore, arguably Canada's leading classical actor, who's portrayed everyone from Pierre Trudeau to Glenn Gould to most of the major leading roles in the canon of Shakespeare. And this is Colm as King Lear, uh, which will open the 2014 season. Whatever the cause of Lear's struggle, be it encroaching dementia or his rejection of Cordelia's incestuous, incestuous wishes, as some people have argued, his own plaintive words in the play reflect the suffering associated with mental illness. Oh, let me not be mad, not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper. I would not be mad. In the 21st century, as we face the reality already acknowledged throughout this week that one in five Canadians every year experiences some form of mental illness, Lear's wish not to be mad remains germane. And so do Shakespeare's careful descriptions of and thoughtful reflections on the experience of madness. They lend themselves, like the rest of his work, to endless interpretation through contemporary lenses across the centuries. And they confirm Ben Jonson's reflection on his deceased fellow playwright, William Shakespeare. And Ben Jonson said, he was not of an age, but for all time. So let's continue to savor his timeless characters, his wordplay, and ultimately his profound human drama. As Hamlet says, the purpose of playing, whose end both at the first and now, was and is to hold as twere the mirror up to nature. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you at the festival. <laughs>